Welcome everyone to the third module of Science Policy and Advocacy for STEM Scientist course. This is going to be focused on STEM education and workforce development. We had great lineup of speakers and there'll be introduction by Lida Benenson from uh, Division of Policy and Global Affairs, National Academies of Sciences. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us for the module on STEM education and workforce development. Some of you may know that I'm really passionate about this topic, so I'm really excited to moderate this panel today. So today you will learn about ways to improve the research enterprise in terms of environments for early career researchers, transitions into careers beyond the bench. And we hope that you will leave this class feeling empowered to affect change in your institutions, as well as learn about how policy change can be effective uh, from a variety of stakeholders in higher education. Today's speakers are leaders who have made impact significantly in STEM education and workforce development for graduate students and postdocs. Several of them are also entrepreneurs and have built organizations tackling important issues in science and policy. So given their many accomplishments, I will only highlight a few of them in their introductions and we're happy to share their bios after the class. In terms of the flow, I will briefly introduce each panelist prior to the class. Uh, they will then present for about 10 to 15 minutes and um, we'll leave the questions until the end to um, hopefully have a really engaging discussion on the topics that were presented. So feel free to send your questions in the chat window. So with that, um, I'll start by introducing our first speaker, Lita Benenson. Lida is a senior program officer and study director with the Division of Policy and Global Affairs at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Prior to her role at the academies, Lida was a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Science Foundation, where she engaged in cross-agency initiatives to improve diversity and inclusion in STEM fields, promote K-12 computer science education, and develop a strategic plan in data science research. Lita was previously editor-in-chief for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, and she's currently a member of the governing board. And she received the AIBS Emerging Public Policy Leadership Award. Lita obtained her PhD in Integrative Physiology and a graduate certificate in Science and Technology Policy from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and her BA in Neuropsychology and Education from Princeton University. Today, Lita will describe her work in higher education and workforce development at the National Academies and ways to increase diversity and inclusion in the system. Thank you, Lita, for being here today. Adriana, thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Awesome. Um, so I'm gonna to try to keep this brief because I saw that there was an arsenal of fantastic questions. Thank you for covering my background, Adriana. I am leaving my email at the bottom of my slide deck. If you do want to reach out to me with any questions about my path here to my position at the National Academy of Sciences or in science policy, I'm always happy to take calls and, and answer questions about it. Um, what I have found in the past is that there are actually very few undergraduate and graduate students who know what the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine are. So I, I didn't want to assume everybody who was tuned into this webinar uh, knew what it was. So I am going to do a brief primer on it before I get into some uh, STEM education related work and also um, things related to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Okay. Um, so the... <laughs> A lot of people get the National Academies of Sciences confused with the National Science Foundation. They are indeed two extremely different entities. The National Academies is far older. It was actually signed into existence by President Abraham Lincoln in 1863, um, which many people don't know. Uh, in addition to being founded by Abraham Lincoln, we are actually not a governmental agency. Um, so I'm not a federal worker anymore. The National Academies of Sciences was actually developed to be a nonpartisan, non-governmental, independent institution that would provide advice on science and technology. So as you can guess, in the 1860s, some of the first projects that the National Academies had were around um, warfare, around transportation regarding the railroad, agriculture. And one of the things that I found very interesting was one of our 
one of our first reports that we ever published in the National Academy of Sciences was um, ideal, ideal circumstances for whiskey distillation. So uh, we, we've already, from the very beginning, covered a broad range of issues in science and technology. And of course, since 1863, the scale and scope of our work has really increased. But I did want you to all make sure you're familiar with the fact that this is an independent agency that's designed to give advice. It's actually to advise the nation um, on science and technology policy and to not be regarded as, you know, being one side or another, but really rooting all of our advice and the evidence and data that is available. We have several arms of the National Academy of Sciences, but the arm that I work in is the part that's about um, science policy and advice. And so the way that we advise the nation on national priority issues in science and technology policy is we'll be presented with a question or we'll raise a question that's of concern to the nation. And to try to address that question, we're gonna assemble an expert committee. So we'll find people from across the nation, sometimes across the globe, who have a variety of expertise that can help inform the um, sort of the, the solution to whatever the problem is. We call them recommendations. Once the committee is assembled, um, what I do is I direct these studies, I direct these committees, I help them assemble all of the available data and evidence. I find people who can provide testimony to the committee. We'll do site visits and interview stakeholders. Sometimes we'll even develop surveys. We certainly conduct a lot of research and we'll even commission papers. And that's all to say we use a lot of methods um, in order to try to create really well-informed recommendations um, to address science policy issues. Our deliverables are usually reports, and we have several kinds of reports that we put out. The, all of our reports that we release have to be peer-reviewed. Um, so Gary, who's one of the panelists here, he and I worked together um, on a project with the National Academies. He served on an expert committee, and that committee had 17 people. So we had to 17 experts had to come to consensus about recommendations that were about addressing issues with the biomedical research workforce. Once the committee came to consensus, which is not easy to get 17 people who are all brilliant to agree on what the path forward should be to answer these problems, challenges, and issues, once they do agree, then it has to go to independent reviewers. And another 17 independent volunteer reviewers then read the report and every single comment they made on the report had to be addressed by both my staff and the committee. So by the time the report is finally published with recommendations, um, it's not unusual for 30 to 50 people who have edited it, looked over it. And so that's how we make sure that we um, really kind of have the gold standard with regards to recommendations that we put forth. It's not an easy process, it's not extremely fast, but we do really believe that it's thorough and fair. Um, typically our audience are policymakers or decision makers, and it can happen at the local, state, or federal level. Uh, oftentimes we are tasked with informing uh, both folks in Congress and the executive office about the recommendations that our committee put forth. Uh, for a lot of the work that I do in higher education, our stakeholders include college and university administrators and staff, sometimes governing bodies or professional societies, scientific societies, um, as well as faculty and students. Although students don't hear from us too often and, and we don't expect them to carry out our recommendations. We think that's a bit of a heavy load for them. Um, the way we get our funding is pretty mixed. Um, basically, anybody can fund a National Academies project or a study. About 25 to 30 percent of our work is funded by the federal government, um, but they are not allowed to have any say in the recommendations. Basically, if you are a funder, whether you're a federal agency, whether you're a private sector organization or a philanthropic organization, uh, you are then forbidden to serving on that expert committee. And that's how we try to maintain our independence. The idea is you pay money to have this study conducted or this project conducted, but you also agree that you're going to trust the process that the, that the National Academy uses um, in order to avoid any bias or conflict of interest. Um, and so we hold to that very, very firmly. So anyway, that's just a very, very broad generalization of what we do at the National Academy of Sciences. I'm always 
happy to answer more questions. Uh, on a personal note, it is a dream job for me. I love working in an advisory capacity. I love working with expert committee members. I get to work with some of the most interesting and brilliant people in the country, but I also have fantastic staff that I work with um, at the National Academy as well. The staff that I primarily work with, although it's become broader, has been the Board on Higher Education and Workforce, um, but I also partner with the Board on Science Education. What I haven't included here is now I'm also involved in Army Research and Development, so I'm working on Army, Army Workforce issues um, as well. And here is just a small sampling of some recent reports that may be of interest to those of you who are, are in the audience. Um, this first one is on graduate STEM education for the 21st century. So the idea that uh, graduate education as it was formed may not necessarily still work um, in today's uh, society. Um, the project that Gary and I work together on is called the Next Generation of Biomedical and Behavioral Researchers. We also do projects on um, building capacity in K-12. You'll see that um, the Board on Science Education actually worked on developing indicators for undergraduate STEM um, efforts. And we also have been working a lot lately on uh, understanding the strengths of minority serving institutions in STEM fields. Um, when you work on issues in education, um, especially higher education and workforce, you know, we've known for decades that one of the issues and challenges that we need to be uh, focused on and use science data and evidence to guide us is on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're working on that on a lot of fronts with the National Academies. One, we have to make sure that the committees who help design the recommendations are actually they themselves diverse. And historically, the National Academy of Sciences was not very good at that at all. Um, most of the folks who served on the expert committee tended to be older, tended to be male, um, tended to be white. Um, and fortunately, that is not what STEM looks like anymore. But the National Academies have been very slow to sort of adapt and incorporate more diverse perspectives and backgrounds in their expert committees. They have been making a bigger effort lately, and um, the board that I work with, the Board of Higher Education and Workforce, has really, really done a great job in improving on the representation, but there's still quite a lot of work to go. And so there's a lot of internal training happening at the National Academies to make sure that volunteers um, are more representative of the demographics of the United States. Um, in addition, we do a lot of studies and projects addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion issue. A lot of these were absolutely in effect before the George, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter uh, movement. However, you can guess that that has added a, another level of urgency at the National Academy of Sciences with regards to where we focus our work. And so this is just like a little snapshot from one of our websites to the National Academy to kind of highlight some of the work that we're doing in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I, I certainly encourage you to take a look at the website um, yourself and see the projects that we're involved in, and always feel free to reach out to us with questions, concerns, and suggestions. Um, and so with that, thank you so much for the time. I, I hope that was helpful to you. I wish we could all meet in person, but if you do in the future find yourself in Washington, D.C., please feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to connect with science policy folks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was curious about something in terms of the reports. Um, are there follow-up actions in terms of interacting with universities and sort of implementation of the recommendations? So by law, the National Academies of Sciences cannot be a lobbying organization. Our job is to, you know, come up with the recommendations and say, this is what the evidence shows, this is what the data shows, but it's up to you to decide how you make your decisions. Right, we understand that data and evidence only go so far when a decision maker is faced with, you know, voting yes or no on some sort of policy. Our, our, our purpose is to give them the best information possible so they can make informative decisions. However, we don't want the work that we do, as we say very often, to collect dust on a shelf. So a lot of our projects do kind of have a dissemination plan where we go out to institutions or we'll go out to conferences or annual meetings. Um, in order to try to at least get the word out, hey, these are what the recommendations are, here is the, the evidence and data that they were based on, and perhaps, you know, a movement or a group or a society can then take those recommendations and then act 
on them or try to, you know, put additional pressure on decision makers to make those changes. But we we are not allowed to do any sort of lobbying, if that makes sense. And that's actually something that I do like about the National Academies is that we have to stay neutral, we have to stay independent, and we stand by the evidence and the data, but we don't stand by necessarily the politics. Um, and that's what I like about it. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. So we have a question about if there are any volunteers, of volunteer opportunities for PhD students to get involved at the academies? Yes, um, although COVID has put a little bit of a damper on things. Um, in non-COVID times, we actually have a fellowship program, a science policy fellowship program at the National Academies of Sciences. It's called the Christine Merzion Fellowship, and it is available both for graduate students and recent graduate students. And it is a paid fellowship experience. I believe it's 10 to 12 weeks. Um, and it is a fantastic opportunity. Um, many of the students who um, end up becoming fellows do stay in science policy or they go on to a AAAS science and technology policy fellowship. Um, that is basically the best way that uh, graduate students and recent grads can get involved with the National Academy. Uh, the, the fellowship is on hold for this year, but hopefully it will be back and running next year. Great. Yes, I'm sure there's a lot of interest in that, um, as well as working at the academy. So one question that we have is, uh, does the academy employ non-U.S. citizens? You know. Oh gosh, I don't think we do. I think I know we have many folks who are from all over the world, but I I believe they are U.S. citizens at this point. But I'm not entirely sure. I think. That might be a really easy search just on the careers page. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in terms of diversity, can you elaborate more about how the Academy is working to implement diversity efforts? Um, that's another question. Yeah, so we actually, we do have a task force within the National Academy as part of our transformation team. Um, it's trying to actually set up processes to ensure that every time a study director like myself or a board director such as my boss um, is helping to assemble an expert committee that they actually take the time to work with sort of assets at the National Academies to help look for diverse representation of the committee. Uh, however, the way that I do it is I actually, um, I partner, not partner, but I have reached out to a lot of scientific organizations um, and other institutions that especially focus on people from um, underrepresented minority groups. For instance, one of them is HAKU, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. They are a massive network of Hispanic, Latin, Latinx uh, professors and students. And so I, for instance, will reach out to them and say, look, I'm developing a committee. Um, the focus of the committee is going to be, you know, let's say COVID and the workforce. Um, I'm looking for a labor economist. Um, would you help me craft a message to, to reach out to your community to see who would be interested and then I'll go through with my staff to kind of sort of filter through the bios and see who would have really appropriate expertise for the committee. And so that's one thing that we do is we try to look to a lot of the organizations and scientific societies that are actually targeted at supporting those groups. Um, and then our executive directors and even our president, our president has to sign off on every committee. And the president now has sort of uh, made a commitment to the institution that she will always prioritize uh, looking for diversity on every committee that comes through. Um, that doesn't mean that we achieve, we've, we're achieving proper representation right now, but we do know that she, of all the things that she's looking at, of all the variables that she considers when she's seeing the makeup of the committee, um, that she is actually considering the diversity of the expert committee. But, you know, honestly, the real work is done by the study director and the staff that supports the study director as well as they kind of go out through their networks and really search and look. There, you know, there's no algorithm yet to find the expertise that you need for all these various projects, but you've got to, you do have to carve out time um, and, and really reach out throughout your network. Thank you, Lita. Um, I have one question um, from Tranel. 
how extensive are the contributions of the new voices initiative at NASM, specifically to the diversity efforts? So the new voices is a very cool but very recent project. So I, I, I cannot say anything about the impact that they have had. I do know that for our board, Board in Higher Education and Workforce, we do often reach out to the director of new voices and ask them if there are people who are in the new voices who may be a good fit for some of the projects that we have coming down the pipeline. Um, and oftentimes we'll reach out to them and if they are unavailable, they'll try to connect us with people that they know who think they think will be appropriate. Um, but I, you know, I cannot comment on impact, but I can say I think it's a move in the right direction for the academies, given that you know the the age, the average age of many of our expert committees was pushing 60 and up, um, and that's really worrisome, especially if you're trying to do work that's about you know looking at what the future of science and technology is and who's going to be actually engaged with that work and also the training that younger scientists go through early career scientists go through is very different from you know the old established guard so um this is something that that is another arm of diversity that we need to have at the national academies um and you know some groups are doing better than others um there's a lot of improvements that need to be made Thank you, Lydia.